I am so happy to see you all here safe. Um, the roads last night were not great. Um, they were a little better this morning, and it is with great thanksgiving and gratitude that I see you here safe this morning. Um, it is Christmas Day, a day that we celebrate the birth of Christ, and it is good to do that together. I want to read this call to worship. We give thanks to you, O oh God, for the body of a tiny baby, life and breadth in a tiny rib cage. Emmanuel, God with us, a promise of salvation. We give thanks for loving parents, for the light of a star, for the radiance of angels, for the running feet of shepherds, for all the joy of that first Christmas. We thank you for today, that you have given our bodies life and breath this Christmas, that we are here now, gathered with these people, joined in one accord in prayer to you. Let the light of Jesus shine in our hearts as we come together for worship. Will you bow with me? Lord, you have gathered us in, and we are grateful for it. And Lord, this is a special day, a day of celebration, a day of joy, a day of peace, and a day of hope. It is a good thing to be together on a day like this. Lord, we have gathered with family, we have gathered with friends, we have celebrated your birth, but here today we do something special. We come together to worship you. Lord, we ask that you would bless our time, bless the songs that we will sing together, bless your word as we hear it. Give us open hearts to receive this gift. We pray in the name of Christ, amen. Our pianist is stuck at home. We are caroling together today, as we would if we went out into the community and so we are inviting you to sing your heart out. These are songs that you know. And so we want to invite you to just lift your voices in song. Marianne. And I stand to sing these songs. So. <laughs>
And once more, good morning. It is good that we are all here safe. Hopefully, the ice skating unintentionally was kept to a minimal. The uh, particular piece of paper that I was asked to read this morning notes at the top, it's a Bible story Christmas prayer. So I would invite you, if you would like, to bow your heads and pray with me now. The news that the word is made flesh comes to us on the pages of our holy book. Tens of thousands of Bibles opened around the world this day. In the good news we read out loud in basilicas and barrios, in chapels, churches, and television broadcast studios. In every language of the world, the good news rings out, and it has come to pass in those days. Thank you, God, for the gift of Scripture, telling us of those first witnesses of your coming, Mary, heavy with child, journeying to Bethlehem, Joseph, anxious with worry, hurrying to arrive in time, the innkeeper, moved by compassion, helping the weary couple, the animals, warm and heavy, gazing quietly on this stable birth. The shepherds on the ground receiving brilliant news from heaven. Thank you for the people who wrote down this story and copied it out manuscript after manuscript. Thank you for those who preserved this good news even in the face of persecution and death. Thank you for those who cherished it and interpreted it, serving up the Bible in words we can understand. Thank you for this country where we can worship without fear, where scriptures can be read and passed on. Thank you for the gospel of Christmas ringing out again this year as it has from the time of Christ, a story of peace and goodwill to all, the story of hope. Holy Jesus, child of the world, child of God, we welcome you into our world. The living savior breathing among us, a savior with surprisingly small hands. In your name, Lord. Amen. And if you would please turn your hymnals far to the back. We are looking for 841 for this morning's responsive reading. Yes. Yes. I will read out the non-bold, and then at the end, where it is italicized, we will all read together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as a father's only son, full of grace and strength. Do we have a scripture reading this morning? Because we just read it together. There we go. We just read this morning's scripture together too.
I was thinking this week of Christmas being on a Sunday, and I was reflecting on the very first church service in this building, I don't know how many years ago, but a lot, because my children were little, my parents were both here, and it, this building was packed to the gills. Was anybody else here that day? Hi, Mark. A few of us. My dad had spent a year of his life here building this building, and so for us it was extra special and extra celebration. But this church was packed then. This church is fuller than we expected today, and we're so, it's still a joyous day, and we're so glad you're here. Let's stand one more time and carol, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. It says 210, I think that's right. I sometimes get my pages mixed up. <laughs>
We wanted today to be a celebratory day. Um, some of you celebrate by the giving of gifts, and, the, and we do want to have an opportunity to do that. There's no formal time of offering, if you notice that in your bulletins today. The, the plates are at the back. If you have something that you'd like to give, you're welcome to do that on the way out. Uh, we want to receive those with gratitude and thanksgiving. Um, but today is a day to celebrate and to enjoy what God has done for us today. I want to read a verse which you've already heard. We read it at the end of our responsive reading, but I want to bring it back to your attention. In the Gospel of John, the first chapter, John says this in the 14th verse, And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. There's another story from John's Gospel that you may be familiar with. One day Jesus was traveling through the countryside. He was going from Judea to Galilee, and in between those two places there was Samaria. And so he happened to be going through this territory, Samaritan territory, and he came to this little little village, uh, Sychar. There was a well there that apparently had been dug by Joseph years and years and years, Jacob, excuse me, years ago, one of the patriarchs. And you may have heard this story. You may be familiar with it. Jesus stops at the well. It's midday. He's hungry. He's tired. And he gets into this conversation with a woman, a Samaritan woman. They talk about living water. Now this woman, as we learn from the account that John gives us, uh, she wasn't that reputable. She had a bit of a, a bad reputation, if you will. She'd gone through multiple husbands Uh, something in that culture that would have been a little unusual. Currently, she happened to be living with someone who was not her husband. A little more shame if you wanted to add to it. There may have been all kinds of cultural reasons why this was the case. Uh, For this scenario there where she met Jesus at midday, but the result was the same. Whatever the reason, she had to come to the well at this time. She could not go at the same time that the other women of the village might have been there in the cool of the morning and she wasn't proud of it not proud of these living arrangements and so when Jesus points it out to her and he knows when Jesus points out this unconventional relationship the woman tries to change the subject she dodges a little bit she can tell that Jesus is a prophet and so she says this response to this prophetic word with a theological question She asks about worship. And Jesus says to her, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Nothing earth-shaking about that so far something we understand. People understand that as part of God's characteristics, this uh, fact that there's no physical presence for God, at least at that time. There was a long history here of people recognizing the separation between the spiritual realm of the gods, some, somewhere out there in the ether where the gods were, and the physical realm where we all do our living. For the children of Israel, Yahweh was that way. He shared that characteristic with the other so-called gods, a spiritual existence. Now, there may have been times where there was a physical manifestation, what they call a theophany. That's where, where God is revealed to humanity or the world. God comes close to that physical existence. You remember the stories from the Old Testament, the burning bush. This is an example, the, the cloud and the fire that led the children of Israel through the wilderness in Exodus, the thunder and the lightning on Sinai. These are all manifestations. So their history, their story, it contained these examples of God coming close to the physical realm. But everybody understood that this was an exception. This was not something normal. And it was a dangerous exception at that. Nobody could be in the physical presence of Yahweh and survive. 
the prophets were afraid to receive the word of God. God had to be especially loving and gracious to let anybody experiencing, experience him in this world. God is spirit. Jesus told that to the woman. Not because God is distant or uncaring or unconcerned about what goes on down here in this physical realm, but because the physical realm isn't equipped to handle the true majesty and the wonder of God. God is too much for us here in this world. Now, if you stop and think about that, that makes pretty good sense. If God is who God is, who God has been revealed to us through Scripture, then this world, the corrupted part of it, the broken part of it, it's not going to mesh very well with the perfect majesty of God. The priests in the temple in Jerusalem, they had this tradition. Once a year, they would go into the Holy of Holies, and the, the one that drew the short straw to do that, they would tie a rope around their waist so that when they went in, if God struck them dead, they'd be able to pull them back out. That's how people responded to the presence of God. And perhaps that's the way that we, sing, we see things. We may need to tie a cord around our waists when we enter into the presence of God in case we are struck dead and have to have that body pulled back out, which creates something of a problem. I mean, don't you want to be in God's presence? If God is who God is and God's wonder and God's majesty and God's glory and perfection are so powerful that imperfect humans like we are can't even come into the presence of God without fear for their lives, then how do we have a relationship with God? How do we come close to God? How do we approach God? How do we find what we need? that redemption that we need if the only source of redemption is so dangerous, so unapproachable. Something has to give. And the Samaritan woman was getting close to that truth. She could see that there was a time coming when, when that barrier between God and humanity would, would thin out, that, uh, a time when it would be bridged. She knew that there was one coming who would answer the question, how? And Jesus said to her, you know, you're right. That time is now. How this all works out, that's something of a mystery. For people who are so immersed, so steeped in this idea that God is unapproachable, too holy, too righteous. Well, the only path that they had to any kind of a reconciliation was ritual, going through the motions, doing the right things in the right place, trying not to make God too mad, basically. But as this woman recognized, even that devotion to ritual only got you so far. I mean, think about it. Who's to say Whose ritual <laughs> is, is correct? Which place is right? Is it this mountain? Is it this temple? Is it this church? Is it the one down the road? Who knows? And so Jesus surprises her. And Jesus surprises us. How do we bridge this gap? How do we get across this divide between the perfection of God, which is so glorious and so wondrous, and where we are, as good as we are, we're just not quite there. Creation, this world that we inhabit, including us, we are part of this creation. It doesn't have the power to bridge this gap, to get to the other side. And so the solution has to originate on God's side. To me, that is an incredibly profound truth. To think about the solution originates with God the healing originates with God I want you to think about this truth 
in this scenario, there are only two parties in the relationship. There is God and there is us. God and humanity. And which of those two parties is capable of coming to the other? It's not a trick question. <laughs> you know the answer. It's not us. Only God can bridge that gap. Only God can come to us. We can't reach God. We can want God, and we do. We can long for that divine presence in our lives. We can hunger and thirst as if our lives depend upon it, which they do. But we cannot reach God. And and this is a hard thing for me to stomach. Even saying it makes me uncomfortable. If God wanted to, God could ignore us. God could say, they're just too messed up for me. It would certainly be God's prerogative to do this. And that's a little heartbreaking to think about. But it's true. And it actually illustrates our total dependency on God. So God has to come to us. God has to come to us, not because he has to, but because he wants to. Now, it may feel like we're doing an awful lot of the work here as we draw near to God. We, we might have to give up a lot of things, all right? We may have to give up staying in our pajamas this morning to come to church. Uh, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe you, these are your pajamas. I hope not. But we have to give some things up when we draw near to God, we, we take a lot of things on ourselves. We give up the pleasures of the world. We take on the discipline of following Jesus. We might even dedicate our whole life. And we'd be right to do so. But we might get to thinking in that process that maybe we're doing it all. But regardless of what we do, regardless of how far we go towards God, the truth is that we can only get to the edge of this gap. Only get to the edge of this, this divide, the chasm between humanity and God. It's a good place to be right there on the edge, <laughs> I'll tell you, because when we're there, at least we're looking in the right direction towards God. We're as close as we can get but it still takes God's action to bridge over that gap. Picture it in your mind. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? That's a pretty big gap, isn't it? Picture that in your mind. Picture a chasm, a gap, a canyon, and make it as wide and as deep as you want to. Make the walls just as steep and sheer as you can imagine. And look over there to the other side, knowing that what you want is over there. Not here over there. Peace is over there. In the turbulent, turbulent and, and trying and difficult life that we live, peace is over there. Healing is over there. Healing, re restoration, a sense of, of, of wholeness, it's over there. And, and we want to get there. We want to be there, but we can't do it. God has to come to us. So what kind of a God would do that? Take that initiative and cross that chasm that separates us. It would not be a God of vengeance, of bloodlust. It would not be one of those capricious gods like the supposed deities of the Romans and the Greeks. This would have to be a God that loves us, that loves us so deeply. It would have to be a God that cares so much for these creatures that he had made that he would not want them to suffer or be lost. God would have to love them so much that he would be willing to cross that chasm. And here's the thing, in order to cross the chasm, in order to make that bridge of redemption, God has to come with us without all the things that make him God, without all the power, without all the majesty, without all the perfection that can be fatal to us. And so God sets that aside, all of that overwhelming godness. And when I say overwhelming, I mean overwhelming. 
and comes to us in a way that makes sense, that we can absorb, that we can relate to. The things that we get familiar with, they can kind of blend into the background sometimes. We get used to them. We get used to warm houses and family dinners, gifts on Christmas morning. It's good things. We get used to candles and ornaments and evergreen boughs. We get used to nativity sets. The stable with Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, that little manger with the tiny little Jesus in it. We see these things all the time. We see them every year. Most of us, we see them for our whole lives. We've seen them so much that maybe we've forgotten the surprise of Christmas. How wonderful it is. Because Christmas is the most wonderful surprise. It's a gift of immeasurable value that we never expected to get. And the most wonderful, precious part is exactly what John tells us in this scripture. It's just a short little verse. The Word. That's Jesus. The Word becomes flesh and makes his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The Word. There in the beginning with God and God himself became like us. Like us. Like we are became flesh and lived with us. Jesus, that precious, creative word, took on the very perishable form that we all carry and lived and lost and laughed and cried and died so that we could live. Are you surprised by that? Is that wonderful? And this is the way that God crosses that chasm. This is the way that God comes to us. When we can't reach God, this is the bridge that connects us. The incarnation. It's a big word for a little baby. It's a lot to carry. But it is the right word. It means, literally, it means putting on flesh. Incarnation. Putting on flesh. A spirit an overwhelming spirit in this case, takes on a body, something beyond us, something majestic, something wonderful, more than we could imagine, more awesome, more powerful than we could withstand, sets all of that wonder and all of that majesty and all of that power aside to be like us. Seriously, are you shocked by that? What? Why would God do that? Matthew and Luke, they tell us this wonderful Christmas story. They point out the way that Jesus fulfills all of these prophecies from the Old Testament, to, to, makes them real, the way that Jesus is recognized by shepherds and wise men, acclaimed as a Messiah. They tell us that kind of story. But John gets at the deeper truth, the implications of all of that that we read about in Matthew and in Luke. John gets to the heart of this. What does it mean for Jesus to be this person, to be this Messiah? What does it mean for Jesus to come at all, to be born in this stable and then to grow up and to teach and to heal and do all the things that he does, even leading up to the cross? What does that mean? What does the resurrection mean? And these are questions that John takes up and the answers are revolutionary. All of the answers are found in God's great love. Everything that John writes in the Bible, all his gospel, the letters, everything that he writes, it's all laced through with the love of God. If you want to if you want to if you want to get soaked in God's love, read what John writes. It's all about love. 
comes back to it again and again and again. Why would this figure that we see about, the one that we read about, the one that we spoke these words, why would this, this pre-existent word who was with God and was God in the very beginning, why would this word become flesh? Why would it take on a body? Why would it want to make its dwelling with us? Why would this, this mighty, majestic spirit, the one that must be worshipped in spirit and in truth, why would it choose to set aside that majesty and become as feeble and frail and broken as you and me? Why? Because on the other side of this chasm, this uncrossable gorge that we're standing on the lip of, there is one who loves us. Oh my goodness. There is one who loves us. Now that rip, that tear in the relationship that is uncrossable from our side, that gap that we've created and we've continued to make deeper and wider with every selfish choice that we make, that chasm can be bridged. It can be crossed. It has been crossed. Not through our effort, but because of that love. That love that becomes human like us, that puts on flesh and lives with us. Oh, this is the, the best verse in the Bible, perhaps. For God so loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that word that put on flesh. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it. God didn't send his son into the world to overwhelm it, to destroy it. He sends his son into the world to make his dwelling with us so that the world could be saved. How many of you have Christmas traditions? Yeah, all, you all do. If you've used an ornament twice in two consecutive years, there's your tradition right there. But I don't want you to get too familiar with Christmas. It can, it can become that way. We can lose sight of the wonder, the, the wonder that God, majestic and powerful and awesome, beyond our comprehension, so perfect, so righteous, that we can't even be in his presence... Don't forget that God also loves us. That his majesty and his power are not for our destruction, are not for our condemnation, but for our salvation. And don't lose sight of the way that God has done that work, has crossed that chasm, has bridged that gap between us. It's God doing it, not us. No matter the effort that we put into it, no matter the dedication we bring to it, the way that we participate, it will always be God's love reaching across that unbridgeable divide, taking a hold of us in our hearts and saying, I love you. It'll always be God. So don't let the wonder of this, this incarnation, this putting on of flesh, the way that Jesus the word becomes flesh and makes its dwelling among us. Don't let that wonder get swept up in the wrapping paper and the leftovers. Don't lose sight of the miracle, folks. When I say miracle and it just rolls off my mouth, out of my tongue like it's no big deal, it's a miracle. And don't lose sight of it. The fact that the word put on flesh and made his home with us. God comes to us, God does this so that we can be saved. And it is wonderful, and it is mysterious, and it is a glorious gift. Receive it. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you. And the words that we use and the sentiment of our heart is weak compared to the magnitude of the gift, but we 
give you our offerings of praise and of gratitude, of thanksgiving, because it is what we have to give. And we are truly grateful to have you come to us when we can't get to you, to have you live like we live because we can't live like you live, to have a chance of redemption. Lord, it is a good gift. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Amen. Could I have you just kind of make your way out and make a circle around the outside? We did this last night with our, with our uh, final song. And listening to each other, singing to each other. Take your hymnal if you need it, by all means. Um, but uh, this, hearing each other's voices as they come towards us is beautiful. You all can come up around the front here. And... Red hymnal? Yes. So, red hymnal if you need one. I'm going to make it hard for you because it's going to be behind you. <laughs> this is one we know. What was the number again? 88. This is wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Dodd. I do. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we ask a blessing on these folks. Thank you for gathering us and giving us this gift of fellowship on this very special day. We pray that you would be with them as they depart from here. Keep them safe on the roads. We pray for those who are at home right now or traveling on the roads. We ask that you would keep them also as safe as, as a babe in arms. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the way that you love us. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.